All right, so we're in a series called More Than Words, talking about the Bible. And this week, I want to talk about sight, spiritual sight, sight. Next, last weekend, I talked about symbols. How many were you here last weekend? And did, did I uh, rock your world a little bit? So, okay. Good. Yes, okay. So this, we're going to do the same thing, just, just to take it a little bit further this weekend, and that is to talk about sight. Now, uh, if you want to turn to Mark chapter 8, uh, I'll get over to Mark chapter 8 in a little while. But let me just tell you something that happened. When I first began to see spiritual types and shadows and symbols and things like that in the Word, um, uh, I can remember I went in a church and the pastor was a part of a theological uh, thought persuasion that believed that the gifts had passed away and that God doesn't heal today and, and things like that. But he was beginning to see some things in Scripture. And he invited me for that purpose to kind of help his church along that path. So I wasn't out of order in, in preaching anything. He was wanting me to. And one night he said to me, uh, or during the day before the night, he said, would you preach on healing tonight, physical healing? And I know God still heals today. And there again, some people think God doesn't heal today, uh, but he does heal today. And so because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you, you, it, it's a uh, I mean, one verse, Hebrews 13, 8, will blow that doctrine away. Or It's not a doctrine, it's a dogma. It will blow that away because if Jesus healed when he was on this earth, he still heals today. He couldn't stop healing, you know. So um, anyway, so he said, would you preach on healing? And so um, I was looking at all these scriptures I had gathered in my Bible. One time I showed you the Bible that I had when I first got saved. And in the front of it, I had just had scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture and I just filled up the pages with it. This is a, a newer Bible. I even in the back, it has uh, maps, and I didn't know what the maps were for, you know, back then. I didn't, I had no clue, so I pasted Scripture over the maps because <laughs> uh, I thought, well, I, the maps, the, the Scripture will help me, you know. So, um, so I went to the Scriptures that I had on healing, and I thought, these are so good, and, and it really doesn't matter what I say about healing. It matters what the Bible says, so I think I'll just read Scripture. Uh, tonight during the service. So I just got up and began to read, starting at Exodus 26, that I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. And I just started reading scriptures, and I went, even went all, just all through the New Testament where it says that they brought many sick people to him, and Jesus laid his hands on every one of them and healed them all. And I just kept saying that, but the word all kept popping up, but it was the Bible. I wasn't just adding it to it, it was the Bible. And uh, so anyway, the next day at lunch, when I met the pastor, um, I think he might have gotten chewed out, you know, by some of his members or something, but he was upset. And so he said to me, I need to talk to you. And uh, so I said, okay. And he said, do you believe that God heals all diseases? Now, I think what he was saying was, do you believe everyone's going to be healed? And obviously, everyone's not going to be healed. Everyone's not going to be saved. We understand that. Um, I preached, I've preached very balanced messages on healing, if you want to go back and listen. Pastor Jimmy Evans, one of our senior pastors, just preached this spring a very balanced message on healing. So we believe a balanced message on healing. But his question was, do you believe God heals all diseases? And so immediately, I just thought of Psalm 103, verse 3, that says that God heals all diseases. By the way, it says that he forgives all iniquities. Do you believe that part of the verse? You better. <laughs> or you're in trouble. So one, it says, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. So he asked me, do you believe God heals all diseases? So I said, well, Psalm 103 Verse three says that he heals all your diseases. And he said, yeah, but do you believe he heals all of them? And so I said, well, Psalm 103, <laughs> verse three says that he heals all your diseases. He said, yeah, but do you believe he heals all of them? Now, let me just remind you of something. 
I never even told him if I believed it. I never even said, well, I believe. I never even said that, which I do, but I never even said that. I simply quoted a scripture. I want you to think about this. If someone quotes a scripture to you and you get mad, you have a problem. You have grown up in some systematic theology thought that has caused you to disbelieve God's word. So he said, yeah, but you believe he heals all of them. Kind of like that to me. And I said, well, Psalm 103. <laughs> and, and he said to me, you're closed-minded. <laughs> I thought, no, you're closed-minded. <laughs> but, okay, so my point is, I, I, then I, 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 just, I, I actually opened my Bible to Psalm 103, verse 3. And I said to him, I said, look, 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 look. I said, look right here, look, look. <laughs> Who heals all your diseases. This is what he did. He went like this. He said, I just don't see it. <laughs> now, what he meant was, I don't agree with that. But what an interesting choice of words. He looks right at it and he says, I don't see that. I want to talk to you about spiritual blindness and spiritual sight because it takes spiritual eyes to understand this book. And you can be spiritually blind to this book. So let me tell you some things about sight, okay? Spiritual sight. Here's number one. Spiritual blindness steals our understanding. Spiritual blindness steals our understanding. In other words, you will not understand the Bible if you're spiritually blind. And then the next point, I'm going to tell you what causes spiritual blindness. Now, remember last week, I went through, I had several people say, um, that was phenomenal when you talked about exegesis. And several, a couple of people said to me, I had never even heard the word exegesis but mainly what we focused on last weekend was allegorical exegesis. And it's the same thing when we're talking about spiritual sight. What, what is the allegory? What is the meaning behind the story or the meaning behind the verse? All right? But let me show you this spiritual blindness that the Bible talks about a lot. A lot. All right? I'll get to uh, Mark chapter 8 uh, a long time from now. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Isaiah 42 verse 18. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Now, can we stop just for a moment? I do not want to be sensitive toward, uh, insensitive toward anyone that has a sight problem or a hearing problem. But here's what he just said. Hey, all you deaf people, listen to me. And all you blind people, look up here. That's, that's what, we just read that in the Bible. So obviously, he is not talking about physical deafness or physical blindness. Would you agree? Man, this is, this is simple. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect? Now we're going to talk about what causes blindness, but that right there gives you a little bit of a hint. Let me just get a little bit ahead of myself. If you think that you're already there, then you're blind. If you think you already know everything this book has to offer, you are blind. Okay, so who is blind but he who is perfect? And blind is the Lord's servant. Watch, seeing many things, but you do not observe. Opening the eyes, the ears, but he does not hear. Isaiah 43, verse 8, bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Again, I'm just giving you the verses. You go back and read the context. He is talking about spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness, not physical blindness or physical deafness. Jeremiah 5, 21, hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding. Let me just remind you that my point is blindness steals our understanding. 
You'll never be able to understand the Bible if you're spiritually blind to it. Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. Ezekiel 12, verse 2, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. That also causes spiritual blindness, rebellion, which has eyes to see but does not see, and ears to hear but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Zephaniah 117, I will bring disaster upon this people and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Another cause of spiritual blindness, walking in known sin. Matthew 13, now here Jesus quotes from the Old Testament and watch how he ties spiritual blindness into a lack of understanding. Matthew 13, verse 14, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed. Now watch, lest they should see with their eyes, please watch this progression, and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Please watch that. Jesus said they, they have to be able to see with their eyes and hear with their ears, spiritual eyes and ears, so that they can understand God's word, so that they can turn, so that I can heal them. Please hear me. Please, please, please. The reason many people are not spiritually healed is because they don't turn from their sin. The reason they don't turn from their sin is because they don't understand what it's doing to them. The reason they don't understand what it's doing to them is because they're spiritually blind and deaf. Did y'all see that? Are you sure you saw that? Because that was, that was better than your response just then. <laughs> Think about what Jesus said. He said they, they, they can't see and they can't hear Therefore, they can't understand. Therefore, they can't turn. Therefore, I can't heal them. You just can't understand what being spiritually blind will cause in your life. It causes you to remain physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally sick. It's God's word that changes people. It's not my illustrations. It's not uh, my applications. It's God's word. This is why I put so much scripture in my messages because God's word is the only thing that will heal you. It's the only thing that will heal you. He sent his word and healed you. I quoted the scripture there and you were clapping, but it's Psalm 107 verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. It's his word. So, so there's a spiritual blindness it's caused. Now, um, let, me, let me just say this, that this, this blindness, um, it, it's possible even in the natural to be looking at something and not see it. For instance, I mean, when we're talking about spiritual blindness, let me just ask you a question, just every campus, and, and why don't you just go ahead and raise your hands, and if you don't, um, then we're going to, we have a freedom ministry for you for lying, um, but <laughs> have you ever read a chapter in the Bible and after reading that chapter, you had no idea what you just read. Can I just see? Okay, all right. That happens because this is a spiritual book. It's a spiritual book. Or you had your mind somewhere else. Okay, all right. So, um, so it happens in the spiritual. It happens in the natural. It, you can be looking right at someone and not see them. Is that true? Because your mind is somewhere else. And what's funny to me is when it happens in church. And, and, you know, you're looking around and you see someone and they're looking right at you. And so you go and wave and they go like this. <laughs> and you think, what, what, what's his problem? Well, I didn't do anything to him. He didn't even wave at me. And what's amazing is though, you're mad at him for three weeks then, you know. Okay, so you can look at something and not see it. Now, let me explain something about this, all right? I love the differences God made between men and women. 
I, I love them except for one, and that is that women are smarter. I don't like that difference. <laughs> but my wife can see things that are not there. I promise you. I will go in my, I'll, I'll go in my closet, and we, we, she has my clothes arranged, you know, suits, shirts, pants, so I can find things. Otherwise, I couldn't find anything. It used to be when I would travel, and I, had, I was traveling during revivals, and she wouldn't be able to travel with me. She put uh, letters in my coats and numbers on my pants and shirt. Literally. I mean, it was like, you know, she'd say, she'd ask me on the phone, what did you wear tonight? I'd say B4. <laughs> it was like bingo, you know? So, okay, so, so, as a matter of fact, should I ought to tell this? When we were young, when we were a small church, it's just Thomas and Mary Beth and about four other people at the church. So, but Debbie was out of town one weekend. I came to church, and Mary Beth looked at me and said, is Debbie out of town? <laughs> so I can't pay out my own clothes, okay? So, but I'll go in my closet, and I'm looking for my blue shirt. And I know what's going to happen. I know it's there, but I can't see it. But Debbie will see it. So I will go through every shirt. Every shirt, every shirt. And then I go in the other room. Sugar. Um, I know it's there. I know it is. I'm so sorry that I have to ask you to get up, but I can't find my blue shirt. And now on the inside, what I'm thinking is, this time I have her. I've got her, because I went through it twice. I got her this time. Here's what she does. She walks in like this. She says, it's right there. It's right there. And then she's walking out one time, and then she turns around and she says, you have eyes, but you can't see. And I thought, no, you're a voodoo woman. That's what you are. You are. You, that, that's voodoo. That's what that is. And I remember I said it one time. She turned and she said, what'd you say? I said, you wonder woman. That's what I said. Okay. All right. So there's spiritual blindness, okay? Here's number two. Pride causes spiritual blindness. We talked about rebellion. We talked about a continued sin. The only reason you would continue to sin is because you're an arrogant person. That's the only reason. And I, I've been there too. The only reason we would continue to sin is because of pride. It's the only reason. Uh, the only reason of, you know, we'd have a rebellious heart is because of pride. Pride is at the root. Okay, so Jesus heals a blind man in John chapter 9. He's blind from birth. No one had ever healed a man blind from birth. You can read it. Since it says since the beginning of time, it's never been heard of a man healed, was healed blind from birth. He heals this man blind from birth, and the Pharisees get mad about it. Isn't that amazing? That is shocking. Do you know in some, of, some churches, I used to be a part of a church like this. I don't mean this wrong. I, used to be, I grew up in a church like this, that every Wednesday night we had prayer meeting. You remember that? Okay. We prayed for the people who are in the hospital. Okay, what we found out, what I found out later was, that was okay, but if any of them got healed, we were in trouble. The denomination, we were in trouble. If people got healed, you're in trouble. So it's okay to pray for them. Okay, so this man gets healed and the Pharisees were mad at, mad at him got, that he got healed. And so they said, who did this? So he says, I don't know. Jesus, I think, a guy named Jesus. So they track Jesus down. Now I want you to watch what Jesus says. Okay. In John chapter 9, verse 39, Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world. Now watch closely. 
Now, he's talking about spiritual sight, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. And then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said, bingo. <laughs> now listen to what he said. He saw my spiritual sight. Remember, this is a spiritual book. If you were blind, listen to what he says. You would have no sin. But now, or the word here could be translated since. But since you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Okay, let me tell you again how spiritual this is. Jesus said, I came into this world that those who are spiritually blind could receive their sight. Do you remember what happened when Paul got saved? Ananias prayed for him, and what happened? Scales fell off his eyes. Think about that. Think about that. Scales fell off his eyes. So Jesus said, I came into this world that those who ca cannot see spiritually will be able to see. And those of you who say that you can see without me, that you don't need me, you're, you'll just be made blind. And the Pharisees said, so are you saying we're blind? And Jesus said, oh yeah, you're blind. You're blind as bats. That's what you are. You're blind. But here's another way he said. He said, if you would admit to me that you couldn't see without me, listen to what he says you would have no sin. In other words, I would forgive your sin. I would erase your sin if you would just admit to me that you're blind without me. I'd, I'd take care. I'd, I'd remove all your sin. That I'm telling you, this is an amazing verse. This is a spiritual book. And then he said, but since you say that you can see without me, your sin remains. Is that amazing? Man, that, this is a spiritual book. Okay, so I want to show you a couple of scriptures that they have to be spiritual. We have to allegorically exegete these scriptures. We have to, because they make no sense otherwise, okay? There are, um, uh, one's in Isaiah, one's in Leviticus. Let me show you these. In Isaiah 4, verse 1, it says, And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Now, look at me for a moment. Didn't that verse minister to you? <laughs> That's one of those verses that you read at night that you think, I have no clue what that means. <laughs> okay. But before you read your Bible, listen to me, please hear me. Every time before you read your Bible, would you say, Lord, I cannot understand this book unless you explain it to me. I can't understand this without you. If you do that, it'll jump off the page at you. Okay, so take symbols like we did last week. It says seven women. Okay, in the book of Revelation, there are seven churches. Churches are called women in the Bible. We're the bride of Christ, right? Those seven churches of Asia Minor, Minor, represent theologically the end time church. There's no doubt about it. I don't have time to explain all of it to you, okay? Here's what it says. In that day, the end time church will take hold of one man. One man is Jesus. Romans says one new man. One man. In that day, the church will take hold of one man. They will say we will eat our own food. In other words, we're going to teach our own Sunday school lessons and we'll wear our own apparel. Apparel always reforms with righteousness. They, they said, take the dirty clothes off and put new clothes on because he's righteous now. I've removed his sin. Okay, here's what they say. Here's, here's what the Bible's saying. In the end times, the worldly church is going to take hold of Jesus, but they're going to say to him, we want to teach our own lessons, and we want to have our own form of righteousness, but let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. I'm telling you, this is a deeper book than you think it is. Okay, let me show you one more. Leviticus 26, verse 26. It says, when I have cut off your supply of bread, bread represents the word of God, 10 women 
So we'll talk about that. That should tell you a little bit. Shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat it and not be satisfied. Okay, let's talk about it. In my opinion, what this means allegorically. He says, in that day, when you turn away from me, Leviticus 26 is a lot like Deuteronomy 28. First 14 chapters of verse 28, Deuteronomy 28, are about the blessings. If you obey, this is what happens. The next are about the curses if you disobey. Leviticus 26, same way. First 15 verses are about if you obey, this is what happens. If you disobey, this is what happens. So this is what happens when you turn away from God. In chapter 26, verse 26. Here's what he says. He says, when you turn away from me, I'm going to cut off your supply of bread. I'm going to cut it off. And he said, when I cut it off, 10 women, that's churches. Listen, listen, here's, let me just go ahead and tell you what I think this means. 10 different churches are going to prepare your bread in one oven, but they're going to prepare your Sunday school lessons in one city, one place. And they'll bring it back to you and measure it out by weight. They'll give you a little Sunday school book with two or three verses in every week, and you'll eat it, and you'll not be satisfied. I can remember a guy saying to me, he said, I, I got the, he said, I'm a Sunday school teacher in a church. And he said, I went through every lesson. I got the book for the whole year. And there's an average of two to four verses every week. And he said to me, that's all the Bible we get. And he said, so I said to the pastor, would you mind if I like, took a concordance and, and added some verses to our lesson? And he said, the pastor said to him, no, th that's enough verses. That's enough. Ten different churches, lots of churches, they're going to prepare your Sunday school lessons in one place. And they're going to bring them back and they'll measure it out to you by week. Hey, you, this week you get three verses. Next week you only get two. Next week you're going to get four verses. And you'll eat it. And you'll not be satisfied. You ever gone to a church like that? <laughs> okay. So I think there's a lot of things in here that, that we need to understand. All right, here's not, here's the, oh, I got to tell you one more thing on spiritual blindness and illustration. When I was um, um, younger, I traveled with James Robson. James is seated down here on the front row, James and Betty, members of our church. James Robson's one of our apostolic elders. Most of you see James and Betty on television, but you, you may not know, James Robson used to do great big citywide crusades like Billy Graham did and break all the conference records in, in cities, you know. Um, the attendance records. When he was doing that, I was traveling with him as a young man, and I would do school assemblies. I, literally, I used to do public school assemblies in some of the largest high schools in America, and they let me in. And I would talk about drugs and alcohol, and I used humor and all, and I couldn't say Jesus or God, but I did say this. I said, you know, you got to be as wise as a serpent, you know? And so I used to say, and, and I, I'd get them right to the end where I'd say, you know, when I was in drugs and I couldn't get free and da da da. And I said, and then I met a man who lived 2,000 years ago who's still alive today. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't say Jesus. I didn't say his name, you know. Just, you just thought it, that's who I was talking about. So it wasn't my fault, you know. So. And then I would invite him to the Crusades, and hundreds of kids would get saved every time, and when James would preach. So James started seeing things in the Word. And I went with him to Louisville, Kentucky, Southern Seminary is there. And one of the professors had been listening to James talk about how we could be blind to the Bible. And he thought, I've been studying the Bible my whole life. As a matter of fact, he had taught New Testament theology, New Testament theology for over 20 years. 13 of those years, he taught the book of Mark. 13 years. So he said to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to go hear James. And he's talking about how we can read this book and our, we still have spiritual blindness. So if I have spiritual blindness, will you show me? Will you show me a scripture that I've never seen? So James gets up that night and decides to preach. And one of the verses he uses is this, Mark 6, 12 and 13. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick, and healed them. And this professor came back to the green room after the service. I will never forget this. He said, James, I've taught the book of Mark for 13 years, verse by verse, and I have never seen that verse in my life. I've never seen that the disciples anointed people with oil, and I've taught it verse by verse. That's spiritual blindness. 
All right, so here's the last point. Jesus opens blind eyes. Here's the good news. <laughs> Jesus opens blind eyes. Now, Mark chapter 8, told you I'd get there. It says, then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him. And they begged him to touch him, so he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Led him out of the town because, you remember, Bethsaida was one of, in the evangelical triangle, and it became one of the cursed cities. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him, he asked him, he wanted him to say something. He asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and he said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hand, I hope y'all just picked up right there, spiritual symbols and spiritual sight. I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Okay, so one night I preached a crusade. I'm in the, a hotel room afterwards. I turned the TV on. There's a TV preacher on. I thought I'd listen. And he preached on this passage. And this is what he said. He said, you see, even with Jesus, it doesn't always work the first time. I couldn't believe it. I thought, with God, it doesn't always work the first time. And so I thought, well, I know that's not right. So I remember thinking, Lord, I'm going to figure this out. There's something else here. There's, something, there's some reason he saw men like trees and you put your hands on them again. So I read it. I read other scriptures. I read everything I could read. Three hours later, I had no clue what it meant. And it, it all of a sudden seemed like the Lord was standing beside me, just, just standing there. Not literally, not naturally. It just seemed like that, you know. And he said, I felt like he just said to me, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to figure this out with no help from you, I might add. <laughs> and he said to me, do you think I know what that means? And I said, well, of course you know what it means. He said, why don't you just ask? So I said, okay, what? And before I could say, what does this mean? When I said, what? When I started the word, what? Like that. He downloaded it on me just like that. Okay. Here's what the man said. Jesus puts his hands on him. Jesus, the son of God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, who spoke the worlds into existence, put his hands on him and said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. Think about the symbols in the Bible. Can I read you a few scriptures? Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the water. I saw men like trees. Psalm 52, verse 8, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of the God. Psalm 92, 12, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the water. Isaiah 55, 12, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. That's talking about people. You've never seen a bunch of oak trees clapping their hands. That's people. Matthew 7, verse 17, even so, Jesus said, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears forever. He's not teaching us to be arborists. He is not teaching about trees. He's teaching about people. And Jesus called them trees. Are, are y'all following me? I just got to read this. I'm, I'm getting out of time, but I'm going to read it anyway. Zechariah 4, verse 11. Then I answered and said, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? Verse 14. So he said, these are the two anointed ones. These are the two witnesses in Revelation who stand beside the Lord of the over. Are y'all? Okay, so Zechariah saw trees. He saw trees. What are these two trees? The angel said, these are two men. These are the two anointed ones. These are the two witnesses in the end time. Are y'all following me? So trees represent people in the Bible. Jesus puts his hands on him and says, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees. Then he put his hands on him again. He restored everything through him. Here's how simple it is. When he put his hands on him the first time, he opened his spiritual eyes. When he put his hands on him the second time, he opened his natural eyes. Just like that. And 
By the way, you can't, you can't just go on my opinion. You might say, boy, Robert, really smart for figuring that out. No, the Bible has to define itself. I've told you that hundreds of times. So the Lord said to me, back up. Just back up and watch what happens. Okay, so at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus feeds 4,000. One time he feeds 5,000, one time 4,000. And then right after he feeds the 4,000, watch Mark 8. Watch spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness. This is right before what we just read, Mark 8, verse 13. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed the other side. Watch. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, Jesus charged them, saying, take heed, beware of the leaven, the yeast, the bread of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Watch this. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, uh, he's mad because we didn't bring any bread. <laughs> it's because we have no bread. Told you we should bring more bread. Talk about spiritual blindness. When Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, he wasn't talking about natural bread. Was he? he was talking about teachings, words, right? Now watch, I love this. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, what? Oh man, I just love this. Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Watch, having eyes, but you do not see, and having ears, but you do not hear. Then listen to what he says here. I like this. Then do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 how many baskets full of fragments did you tell you? They said uh, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you tell you? They said seven. So he said, how is it you still do not understand? Here's what he was saying. Fellas, if I wanted bread, I'd just whip a sum up. <laughs> I, I am not talking about bread. Five loaves, and I fed 5,000. There's one loaf in this boat and 13 dudes. <laughs> bread is not the problem. I am not talking about bread. I am talking about something in the spiritual realm, but you have eyes, but you can't see. And you have ears, but you can't hear. And I'm telling you, if you do not read this book, with spiritual eyes, you won't get one thing out of it. And here's the problem. If you don't read with spiritual eyes, then you can't understand it. And if you can't understand it, you will not turn from what is keeping you from getting healed. This was a really, really good sermon. Just tell me, this is good. Okay. Bow your heads and close your eyes. We're all going to respond today. Now, you can come down in a moment for prayer, but I want everyone to pray. Just a moment. Every campus, every affiliate church, I, I want me to pray. I'm going to pray too, but I want you to repeat this prayer after me out loud. Seriously, like you mean it. I want you to pray this to God, even though you're praying it after me, Okay. Every one of us, let's repeat this to the Lord. Dear God, I repent of my pride and I ask you to forgive me. And I come to you as a child and I tell you, I cannot understand your book without your help. And I receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen and amen.